Hey everybody, today we're going to talk more about the regular representation. One of the nice things that we can do with the regular representation is we can use it to find embeddings of an algebraic group into GLN for some n. This is equivalent to finding some sort of finite dimensional faithful representation of the group. In particular, to start out, I want to remember if I begin with a free module of rank n over k, along with some sort of co-module structure, where a here is the coordinate ring of an affine group scheme. Then I obtain, obtain an induced map going from G into GLV. And the way that this works is it sends a particular G to the matrix whose entries are A, I, J, sub R of G. Where here I'm viewing G as an element of G of R, and I'm viewing A, I, J as some element in A, which in particular is the collection of natural transformations from G to a1. So in particular, AIJR is going to be some map which goes from GR into R. So this is giving me some matrix or some linear transformation over V. And this map is obtained by choosing a basis for V. We'll write that down up here. EI is just some basis. In which case, I know that rho of EI is going to be equal to, let's actually do rho of EJ. It's going to be, no, I actually like rho of EI. This is going to be the sum over J of EJs tensored with AJIs. And this is how I can write any element in the tensor over K with A. So this defines a group homomorphism between G and the general linear group of V. And it's just associated to this particular co-module structure. And in particular, the representation is faithful if this isn't a closed embedding. Of these affine group schemes, or equivalently, if on the level of coordinate rings, it's a surjection. And let's think about what it's doing on the level of coordinate rings. So on the level of coordinate rings, And this is, should feel like a review of some stuff that we talked about last time, because we definitely defined this map uh, during our last video lecture. Anyway, on the level of coordinate rings, we're ending up with some sort of map, which should be going to, from O of GLV all the way to, let me fix that up, so it's the coordinate ring of GLV. coordinate ring of G. And how should that work? Well, let's think about what this coordinate ring is. O of G of V is isomorphic to the polynomial ring in K X1, 1, X1, 2, all the way through x and n, where, again, n was that dimension of that representation, so it's another element on that basis. Then we throw in an additional letter t, and we quotient out by the relation that the determinant of the matrix whose, co whose entries are the xij's 
times t has to be equal to 1. This in particular force is the determinant of that matrix to not be 0. In particular, it should be the inverse of t in this frame. And that's a familiar construction that we did say one. So what we're really looking for here is we're looking for a map from this to OG, which is corresponding to this map the other direction, which I've written down up here for you. And the map is really obvious. What it's going to do is this is to send the xij entry going to send it to AIJ. Note in particular, the matrix of AIJs is going to be invertible because it's going to be an image of an element of the group, so its inverse is going to be a G inverse value. So that's pretty awesome, and that's a good thing to remember here, is how we're inducing these embeddings. And the question is, is this particular map going to be subjective? That's the question we're trying to answer. And we're thinking about whether or not this representation is faithful. So it's an interesting kind of thing to try to answer. And we should remember here as well, how are these AIJs being defined? Well, they're being defined through a basis for B. So what I wanted to do today to start out uh, well, I guess it was this, but right after this, I wanted to think about how can I construct a faithful finite dimensional representation? In other words, how can I find an embedding of a group G into GLN? And not every group will have it. We have to have the coordinate ring of the group be finitely generated. But our main topic for today was the regular representation of G. So. I'm sure that'll be involved at some level. Let's start out by thinking about the regular representation. This is done by viewing A, that is the coordinate ring of G, as a K-module, with the co-module structure over A given by the co-multiplication map. is supposed to be some map going from my module to my module tensor over k with a and of course there's a very very reasonable map here it just takes a v and sends it to the co-multiplication to do this i want to think about some finitely uh, some finite dimensional submodules of the left regular representation but one of the things I need there for this is to show that if I take some finite subset of my co-module and I explore the sub-co-module that they generate, then that sub-co-module itself will be finitely generated as a k-module. And it's worth noting that this is not immediately clear uh, just from the definitions of things. Like there's takes improving to show that any finite collection is going to sit inside a subco module, which is a finitely generated k module. So this is our sub problem to show that any finite subset of my co module must be contained in some co subco module, which is going to be finitely generated as a k module. But let's set that subproblem aside for a second, and we'll address that later. Let's just go ahead and assume that that's the case. And using that result, which we'll prove in a little bit, I want to show that any algebraic group can be embedded into GLN for some n. So to start out, let's think about an algebraic group over a k. And again, let's remember but this is the same thing as an affine case, uh, sorry, an affine group scheme. Where the coordinate ring is finally generated as a k algebra. So this is what an algebraic group over k is. 
And what I want to prove is that in this case is that the regular representation has a finite dimensional sub-representation. And here ta I'm taking k to be a field for this. So we don't have to worry about things being free and all that kind of stuff. And uh, not only does it have a finite dimensional sub-representation v, but the sub-representation is faithful. And in particular, inducing an embedding of G into GLV. So this is embedding my algebraic group into the group of n by n matrices, where n is the dimension of V. So we're really thinking about closed subgroups of GLN. And it's tempting to say, and, and take this and run away and say, ah, well, if we're just studying closed subgroups of GLM, we should have just said that from the get-go. I mean, that's what we're thinking about. I'll just define affine group schemes to be those things and, and go with it there. But when I take an affine group like GM or GA or, or, you know, even these groups associated to these affine group schemes associated to finite groups, like the affine group scheme associated to the symmetric group on N letters, Coming up with an embedding into a matrix group involves a lot of choices and can be not very natural. So it's typically in a lot of in a lot of situations it's much easier to work with the group as it's naturally presented in the given situation. Forcing everything to be embedded into GLN is kind of like uh, heavy handed, a little bit of a burden. And uh, also some groups will not have embeddings into GLN, obviously. Uh, uh, affine groups which are not finally generated need not have these sort of embeddings though they do have filtered embeddings and these sort of things but let's try to prove this theorem and I'm going to use the result that I had mentioned above that said that if I start out with a finite subset of my representation then it's going to be contained in a sub-representation which is going to be finite dimensional over k. So what I want to do here is I want to start out with a nice finite subset and I know that OG is finitely generated as a k algebra. So what I can do right away is I can choose a finite set of generators. Let's call it lambda of a which generate a as a k-algebra. And then what I want to do is I want to think about the finite dimensional sub-representation of A containing lambda. That is to say, I'm going to let V be the co-module or A finite dimensional module containing lambda. And like I mentioned above, we'll prove this that we can do this later. Okay. So this co-module is going to correspond to a sub-representation. And therefore it's going to induce a map from G into GLV and the way that we started out today discussing. And what I want to show here is I want to show that this is going to be a closed embedding. So that's kind of my idea. And the nice thing that I have going for me is I know exactly how this operates on coordinate rings. So I start out by defining those AIJs. So remember, I've got these elements here. 
AIJ. NA. And in case it wasn't clear, let me mention that A here was just the coordinate ring of G like it typically is. But I have these AIJs defined by using the co-module structure, which in this specific case is given by the co-multiplication map. And it's where I send an element EI to a direct sum over J of EI tensor AIJ. Oops, uh, let's write it this way. EJ tensor AJI, where here uh, the EIs is 1 to N are a basis for B. So just like above, this is how we define this thing. And then the induced map on coordinate rings is this map which goes from OGLV to G. And this thing is, again, just this polynomial ring over the field K in X11 through XNN T mod that usual relation that the determinant of xij minus t, uh, sorry, times t minus 1 is equal to 0. Fix that up a little bit. There we go. Minus 1 is equal to 0. So this is this map which sends xij to Oops, and that was on the right hand side here should be OG, which is A. And it's I'm sending XIJ to AIJ. And what I want to do in this particular case is I want to show that this map is surjective. If this map is surjective, then the map on the group schemes here will be a closed embedding. That's the same thing. So what I need to do here, I need to show this is surjective. But that turns out to be pretty easy. If I remember that I'm dealing with a Hopf algebra, I know in particular the map from the identity tensored with the co-unit composed with delta is just going to be the identity. And this is super useful because that means that the identity tensored with epsilon of delta of one of my basis elements has to be that basis element. But if I look here, this is also going to be the sum over j of ej tensored with aji, oops, uh, not aji, but of course the co-unit epsilon of aji, which is, you know, this is a tensor over k. What we mean by this is literally just that linear combination. So I can write this as epsilon of aji times ei. So this is just this linear combination here. Uh, so actually, let me back up. I want to do this the other way. So I can actually compose with uh, epsilon on the left and the identity on the right. And this still holds to be true because I've got that hop algebra structure that I'm dealing with.
and this is going to give me, in this particular case, epsilon of ei times, sorry, epsilon of ej times aji. So in particular here, the upshot is that ei is going to be inside the span over k of the aij's. So, I'm thinking about, again, I'm thinking about the image of this map, which is the algebra generated by the AIJs. So the algebra generated by the AIJs, which is just, I'm going to denote this way, A11 through A12, all the way through ANN. This is going to necessarily contain the algebra generated by the EIs. which is going to in turn you know, contain the algebra generated by their span. Um, and in the span of each of the EIs, I can actually get all the elements of lambda because the EIs were a basis for that module V and V contained lambda. So this is going to contain the, the algebra generated by all the lambdas, which is just A. So since this was contained in A, what we, what we see here is that this actually has to be A. And this showed that the map here that we started out with is indeed surjective. Therefore, the induced map going from G into GLV is an embedding. This means that V is a finite dimensional faith representation of G. And this is also giving us our embedding to the matrix group, so this is very nice on two different counts. And the main tool that we used here, again, was, besides what this map looks like, the fact that any finite subset of my co-module can be contained in a sub-co-module, which is finally generated as a k-module. So let's try to figure out how we might prove that. To prove that, I need to use the relationship between co-modules of a co-algebra and modules of the dual. To begin, let's start with a co-algebra C with co-multiplication map delta and co-identity epsilon. The dual of the co-algebra is C dual, which is the vector space of k linear maps C to K. And the punchline is that this is an algebra. So the dual of a co-algebra is an algebra. And to say that it's an algebra, I need to tell you what the algebra structure is, which in particular means I need to give you a multiplication map that is a morphism going from C dual tensor with C dual the C dual. And the way this works is to mimic the case when I'm looking at the representation of a group scheme. I'm just going to take elements F and G. So I'm going to set in the simple tensor F tensor G to nabla composed with F tensor G. composed with the co-multiplication map delta. So this will be a function which again goes from C to C tensor with C over K via delta, then to C tensored over C over, over K with C via F tensor G, and then back to C via, oh sorry, excuse me not back to C, but to, uh, this goes to K tensored over K with K because F and G are taking values in K 
and then Nabla takes this to k. So this is our multiplication. And we also want an identity map. It should correspond to a k-algebra homomorphism from k into c dual. That is to say, a k-linear map from k into c dual. And the natural choice is to just take a constant lambda. And it needs to be sent to, to lambda times some function, whatever we send 1 to. And the co-identity is the natural candidate there. That's a map going from c into k already. So it's already an element of c dual. So this is a way to go from a co-algebra to an algebra. Let's look at an example of that that's particularly relevant to this course. Let's let G be a finite group. And what I want to do is I want to consider the collection C, which is just the set of all maps going from G K. And these are just maps of sets. And we've already talked about before how this is actually a Hopf algebra. In fact, it's a commutative Hopf algebra. The algebraic structure just comes from the algebraic structure of k-valued functions on G, where I can add them together, add two k-valued functions on G, get a new k-valued function, and I can multiply two k-valued functions on G and get another k-valued function on G. So that's a nice commutative algebra. Here my k is a field, so it's a nice commutative algebra, otherwise maybe not. But it also has a co-algebra structure. And to see that co-algebra structure, that is, that map, I, I need to actually look at what the, the co-multiplication is. There should be some map going from C into C tensored over K with C. And to tell us what this is, it's very helpful to remember that this latter set is actually isomorphic as a vector space to just the collection of all set maps from G cross G into K. In particular here, I can send an element F tensor G to the function, which sends a pair AB to F of A times g of b. So to specify the co-multiplication, I'm really just looking for a certain c linear map going from c into the set of functions from g cross g into k. And the way that we do this is it sends a function f, which again is just some function from g to k, and it maps it to the function, which takes a, a pair AB and returns F of AB. Incidentally, we also know that C is the Hopf algebra corresponding to the affine group scheme that we associate to the finite group G. Now let's think about the dual of C. So I'm thinking about C as a co-algebra and my question here is what is C dual? This is the collection of all linear functionals from C to K so this is Hom over K from C to K and 
I have a basis here consisting of the linear functionals just given by a particular group element. So given g and g, we have a linear functional defined by just evaluation at g. I'll call that chi g. And what that does is that sends an f. It's so f of g. This is a linear functional. So we have a natural map going from g into hom over ck, uh, hom from c to k. And this extends to a map from the group ring kg into here. So what this does here is it sends a linear combination, a formal linear combination, over g and g of elements of the group times elements of k. So maybe like, how about alpha g times g, and it's going to send it to the linear functional sum over g and g of alpha g, that constant, times chi of g, which specifically is this map which sends an f to the sum over g and g of alpha g times f of g. This is a, a nice linear functional on C. And if we remember what our co-multiplication is for that co-algebra, I know also what my multiplication is going to be. So g times h is going to be equal to nabla composed with, actually let me write it this way to be less confusing, chi g times chi h, so these linear functionals are going to be their tensor product, let me make that a chi h, chi g tensor with chi h, composed with delta, which evaluates to chi of gh. So the map that we defined going from kg into hom of, uh, of sorry, k linear maps from c to k up here, not only was this a k linear map, it's actually an algebra homomorphism. Indeed, it's actually an algebra isomorphism. And this is why the co-modules over C are exactly corresponding representations of KG in fact we can prove something much more what we can show is that there's a natural bijection between co-modules V, let's just say co-modules of a co-algebra, C, and modules of the dual algebra. And this correspondence associates to any module V, the dual module, V dual, which is the collection of K linear maps from V into K. So the co-module structure over here, remember, is some sort of map which goes from V to V tensored over K with C. And we send this to a module structure, which should be a map going the other way. V dual tensored over K with C dual. And we need to send that to something in V dual. 
The way that this works is it mimics the case when we're defining the algebra structure. And the way that I'm going to define this module structure is I'm going to send a simple tensor consisting of a linear functional on V, let's call it eta, tensor with a linear functional on C, let's call it chi again, and I want to send it to a linear functional on V. And the one that I'm going to send it to is the composition of nabla composed with eta tensor chi composed with the rho over there rather than delta from before. Where here, this is the composition of three maps. The first one goes from V into V tensored over K with C, that's rho. The second one goes into V tensored over K, excuse me, goes into K tensored over K with K, and that's eta tensored with rho, or sorry, eta tensored with chi, and then to go into k again, I'm just using the obvious map, which I'm denoting by nabla. So all told, this composition is giving me a linear functional on v.